All right, everybody, welcome. Give a couple minutes for everybody to kind of find a seat, make their way in. Just want to thank everybody for being here. Cliff's going to talk real quickly or slowly, depends on how he wants to do it, um, about an event he's got coming up here. Good evening. Thank you all for coming out. Don't kind of find a seat. Sit down somewhere. Okay. Um, how many of you got these flyers? We're doing a shotgun patterning shoot a week from Saturday out at Ben Avery. Um, if you turn it over, you'll see a map of where we're going to be. You can come in from the west end. It's a little bit easier sometimes than the east end, but this will give you the, the dynamics of it if you want to come out. And we've got, we're going to be shooting 20, 30, 40 yards. Um, preference will be given to shotgun shooters. If we don't have a lot of shotgun shooters and you happen to have a 9mm or an AR-15, we might be doing that too. You never know. It just depends on how many people we get. So take a look. I will leave this out there. This is the last one we have. Uh, if you're on Facebook, CHA has had this on theirs. But take a picture of it. Roll it over. Take a picture of it. Where the blue arrow is is where we're going to be. Okay? If you have any questions, I'll be around out here. Thanks, Cliff. All right. Um, before we get started, a couple of announcements. Um, hopefully everybody got some food and drinks. There's plenty of drinks still out there. So if you get thirsty, go grab something. Kyle's here from Cut and Strut Taxidermy. Kyle, raise your hand. Just say hi so they know who we are. Um, for those of you that are lucky enough to be here at the end, which I highly recommend that you stick around, Kyle has graciously donated a full turkey mount. Okay? So at the end of this seminar, we're going to give everybody in attendance a ticket. There's no cost. And one of you will walk away today with a full turkey mount. So thank you again for blessing us with that. Let me open in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started here real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for just allowing us to gather here to learn about wild turkeys and their habitat and how we can best enjoy the woods and your, that you've blessed us with, Lord. Just thank you for everybody here in attendance. Uh, bless this evening and bless us on our travels heading home tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. If you want to come on up and you can bless us with some turkey talk. All right. Try not to disappoint you too much. <laughs> How's everybody doing tonight? Pretty good. It's a lot better uh, reaction than I had last week when I was in Yuma. So, uh, just a quick, quick question right off the top. Uh, raise your hand. Who here has haunted turkeys before? So, what do you need me for? <laughs> All right. Who has a tag this year? Now I know why you're here. All right. Just so I know who to hate, who's got a ghouls tag this year? All right, get out. All right. All right, so uh, a little background about myself. Uh, my name is Jesse Warner, Jess Warner. I answered everything except late for lunch. Um, I am an R3 coordinator for the NWTF, the National Wild Turkey Federation. And if, is anybody here, if anybody is familiar with R3, you know that it stands for Recruitment, Retention, and Reactivation. So my job, uh, my day job is to pretty much help folks get into hunting. Um, do my best to recruit new hunters, retain hunters we have, and reactivate the ones um, that have gotten out and bring them back into the, the hunting culture. Um, so, yeah, it's the best job in the world. Uh, I've been in Arizona about six years, so you're probably going to hear me refer to Easterns a lot just because that's what I cut my teeth on. Um, and when I'm having an issue uh, mentally, I always go back to, I always go back home. Um, I have hunted Miriam, so don't, don't be too worried. Uh, I'm not totally in the dark when it comes to Miriam's Gould or Rio's. Um, yeah, could we get the first slide up, please? Can we get the next one, please? All right, so just going to do a, a brief history on different uh, on the different kinds of turkeys. Um, go super basic. So everybody thinks of when you think of turkeys, you know, we think of Miriam's, think of Gould's, think of Rio's, et cetera. Um, there's actually two species of turkeys. A lot of folks refer to it as species. Um, there's actually five subspecies of turkeys that we know here and one species uh, that's separate. That's the oscillated turkey found down in the Yucatan and down in Central and South, uh, yeah, just Central America. Um, I always forget what their specific epithet is, but it's actually not the same species as what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, next slide. So when we refer to the wild turkey here in, you know, from Mexico north, we're talking about uh, Meliagris gallopavo. 
And from there, we have the different, the five known, uh, the five subspecies that we all talk about. Yeah, figures you guys are going to be here. <laughs> yeah, so uh, just run through the five. Um, first up, we have the Easterns. These, are, these birds cover the most ground out of, uh, or at least the number, the most ground by number of states, not so much by how much uh, actual square mileage. Yeah, the Osceola. Um, looks a lot like an eastern, but it's only found in the bottom two-thirds of Florida. That's what guys are hunting on right now. So if you've been on social media uh, and see the guys hunting down the swamps, this is what they're chasing. Yeah, the Rio Grande. Uh, we do have Rios in Arizona. They're not native to the state, but they were introduced in 2008 uh, to Black Rock Mountain up in the Arizona Strip. They came out of Utah. The Miriams. So here's our bread and butter. Uh, this is the bird that most Arizonians know as the wild turkey. Um, they're up and down the Mogollon Rim. Uh, they, co they, they cover the most ground in Arizona. Uh, you can always tell them apart from the other species, but they have that, that kind of cream-colored tail. You see the very, very the wingtips, or the, on the retrices. It's a fancy word, means tail feather. Um, and then we're going to go through this in a bit, too, but just a quick show of hands. Who thinks this bird is a tom? Uh, so this, um, so we have two, I forgot to ask that, yeah, if I, was gonna, I was asking if it was a Tom or a Jake, it's a Jake, all right, so you guys, again, why do you guys need me here, all right, <laughs> and then the ghouls, yeah, the ghouls, they are also native, um, they were hunted out uh, years and years ago, but they were reintroduced from the Huachuca Mountains in, in 1983 from Mexico, um, I recently heard my new favorite word, way to pronounce Huachuca, the Huachuca's. So I just want to say that because I figure there's only going to kick out of it. Next slide. Yeah, so historically, wild turkeys were in a decline. This is nation nationwide. Um, this presentation is out of South Carolina, so you guys know. So it's a lot of it's going to be focused on the east, um, at least for now. We're going to get back into Arizona specific here in a bit. Um, but yeah, so prior to Columbus, prior to European colonization, there were roughly 10 million birds uh, in North America. Uh, and by the 1930s, they were only in the small, inaccessible pockets. Um, pretty much folks just hunted them to survive. They were easy to hunt. And, yeah, they were just hunted out. Next slide. One of the reasons was habitat destruction, deforestation, unregulated harvest um, well before hunting seasons were brought, uh, brought into place in the U.S. And here's the map if you want to hold it here for real quick. Um, one thing I think is cool is this is from 1941, and it showed the, the range of the wild turkey in 1941. And way over here in Arizona, the Miriams were never hunted out. So uh, the Miriams we have here are not transplanted birds. They're the same birds that have been here always. Okay, next slide. Yeah, like we said before, they're only found in remote areas. Um, Arizona is pretty, pretty dang remote. Uh, in the Depression years, as rural populations shifted to urban, things began to change, and the birds became, uh, started to increase. Obviously, folks started going to the cities, started going for jobs, um, and allowed the birds to rebound and, and come back. Yeah, so we're going to get into the wild turkey restoration. So a little bit of history on the NWTF. The, hit, the NWTF was started in 1973 by a couple of guys in South Carolina, actually originally in Georgia to help the wild turkey rebound, help them come back. And one of the best ways that they found was through uh, trap and transfer. By trap and transfer, everybody's probably seen the, the videos of rocket netting, um, going out, baiting wild turkeys, shooting a net over them, and really, uh, capturing them, putting their transmitters on them if need be, well, that's after all this, and then taking them someplace else and releasing them. Why do we do that? Why do we go through all that work to trap and transfer a wild turkey when you can go down to the farm down the road and buy some wild turkeys, or buy some turkeys and just let them go. It doesn't really work that way. Um, pen reared birds don't really uh, succeed in the wild. Um, yeah, so the turning point was when that cannon net was invented and allowed that trap and transfer, uh, allowed the trapping part anyways to really take off, really be successful, um, put in a lot less stress on the bird, allowed them to survive in the wild. Yeah, and then uh, the, through the NWTF, they, um, we help facilitate interstate transfers. So that's like taking birds from 
Uh, like I just mentioned with the reels, they were brought from Utah into Arizona. That wasn't always a thing in the past. It was not a lot of cooperation between the different state wild, fish and wildlife agencies. So the NWTF helped to facilitate that and allow for those, that, those transfers to take place. Um, yeah, so today we're not back up to the 10 million, but we're at nearly 7 million. So we've come a long ways in bringing back the wild turkey. Um, and everybody, like everybody always hears, uh, hunters are conservationists. Hunting is conservation. Um, and that's because hunters fund the conservation dollars. Through the Pittman-Robertson Act, um, if folks aren't, actually, quick, raise your hands. Who's not familiar with Pitt Pittman-Robertson? Who's never heard of that? All right, so a couple of hands. Just a um, brief background. Uh, in, I'm going to probably get this wrong, but I believe it was still in 1973, uh, an act was passed through Congress um, sponsored by two guys named Pittman and Robertson, or actually proposed by those two guys. Um, and what that does is it, it uh, puts a 11% excise tax on honey goods. So guns, ammo, your turkey vests, binoculars, different hunting goods, it's an extra 11% that is then redistributed out to the states directly for wildlife uh, research and um, just in wildlife work. Yep, license sales and excise tax. So remember the map from 1941? This is where we were at in 2009. Uh, yeah, it doesn't show that our reels on there because it was only, they probably didn't even know that the reels were in Arizona before they brought them in. But you can see just the expansion that happened from 1941 to, to 2009 um, as a direct impact from the NWTF and from our Space and Wildlife Agencies taking a focus on the wild turkey and realizing the importance of the wild turkey and bringing them back. Next slide. Yeah, so what does a turkey's year actually look like? Um, so like us, uh, I always figure my year starts in the fall. It doesn't start January 1st. It starts when the hunting season first kicks off. So we're gonna, that's where we're going to start here. Um, in the fall is when we're going to see a lot of the fall breakup. Um, you're going to see adults and juvenile hens get together. Uh, the adult gobblers will break off, and you'll see some of the juvenile gobblers start breaking off into little groups by themselves. Um, later in the spring, you'll see those jakes come back, um, or the ones that mature, and they'll be with the hens. Um, but that time of year, they're just trying to survive. So they get into smaller groups. It allows for uh, ease at, so survival in the wild is always about collection of energy, right? Um, in getting that food, getting that water. And if there's not, there's a big bunch of birds, not a lot of food in the area, there's not a lot of energy, um, it's not going to allow that particular flock to survive as well. So the birds will break up and cover more ground and with the hopes that more of the, the smaller flocks will survive rather than just one big group. Um, yeah, establish, they'll establish some dominance in the wintertime. Next slide, please. In the spring, that's what we're interested in right now. So the spring, that's the breeding time. That's when everybody starts getting real vocal. That's when you start hearing that gobbling, that yelping. That's when uh, my spring really begins. Um, the flowers are nice, the birds are nice. Gobbling is the, is the first real sign of spring to me. Um, through that breeding, it's also when you have your, your, your nesting start, starting to occur, and then obviously from the nesting, you're hopefully going to have some hatching. In the summertime, you're going to have those hatchings. After the, that hatching goes into the summer, uh, those poults are going to start to grow. And by poults, I mean baby turkeys, just for folks that don't know the nomenclature. Um, and those gobblers that have just done all that work to bring those harems together, get all those hens, they go off and leave, and we go right back into the, into the fall seasons. Yeah, so the hunting season, um, obviously, I know you can hunt turkeys in the fall, but obviously for right now, we're going to be talking about the spring seasons. Um, again, spring is the mating season. Uh, gobblers are the surplus. So this is why we can shoot gobblers in the springtime, because you don't need as many of them for the population to survive. So we're allowed to uh, take that surplus out. Um, yeah, turkeys are real vocal. Uh, they attract each other by the calling. Everybody knows this. This is what we all enjoy is to hear those birds gobbling and to use yelping to uh, get those, tur those turkeys in. And as hunters, what we're doing is we're trying to imitate the sounds uh, of the hen to attract gobblers. Some folks will try gobbling. Um, I'm not a fan of that personally. Uh, like everybody in here knows, um, we have a lot of folks in here that turkey hunt. And it's just like that old adage, you get 100 folks together, you're going to get 100 different opinions. Um, same way with turkey hunters and no different. The way I turkey hunt is probably going to be different from how 
every individual in here, Tricky Hunt, um, and you get your own style, you get your own way of going about things and doing things. So I'm just going to be talking about my way to go about it. Thanks. Yeah, Tricky ID. So when we're out there, um, it's kind of important to be able to tell a hen from a gobbler, right? So next slide. All right, so first up, we're going to have the Jake. So a Jake is an immature juvenile tom, it's a juvenile male bird. Uh, he's going to look a lot like a tom in his basic colors. He's still going to have the red, white, and blue on his heads. He's going to have that darker black body. Um, but the most telltale, at least in this photograph, little tiny beard. Um, I've seen some of them with no beard. I've seen some of them with a six-inch beard. Uh, but a very, very short beard uh, the, that stands in the way. But if you can see his legs, here, go back real, real quick. If you can see his legs, you can see he's just got little bumps on his legs. He doesn't have actual spurs. Um, here, let me move the stand real quick. Can everybody see it down here? Kind of. So right, yeah, right here is what I'm talking about. Just a little tiny uh, bump. He doesn't have an actual spur like a tom will, like a chicken will. All right, next slide. All right, versus the gobbler. Um, this is the one everybody's going for. Again, he's going to have that red, white, and blue head. He's going to have the black body. Um, both of these birds are going to be larger than the hens. But he's going to have that full, mature beard. Um, you will see some birds will have a shorter beard from beard rot. Maybe somebody shot it off. But the other way to tell... Um, because that grass is pretty tall in this photograph, you can't see his spurs. But looking at that tail feather, uh, yeah, looking at the tail, looking at those retrices, um, like we were talking, like I asked at the beginning of the seminar, um, and everybody seemed to know it, so I'm not sure why I'm doing this part. Uh, on, a, on that tom, his retrices, those tail feathers, make a nice, smooth curve. Versus on that Jake, you saw he had a stepped appearance. Those middle six feathers grow a little bit longer than the rest of them. Uh, and it gives them that stepped appearance, makes them real quick to identify when they're in, in strut in front of you. Uh, if you. Sometimes you don't always get to see that beard depending on his angle, depending on, his, on the brush. Next slide. Versus the hen. So you can see she's still got a little bit of color to her head. It, um, she's missing the red. Uh, it's usually going to be some form. A lot of folks will say it's gray. Uh, I've never really liked that because you will see, like in this photograph, a um, little bit of white at the top and a little bit of that darker slatish blue towards the neck, towards the throat. Um, and sometimes that can be confused. But most folks, if you're, if you're reading or uh, if you're reading bird guides or any way how to identify a bird, they'll always say that the head is gray and the body is going to be smaller and much more brown in appearance. It's not going to be uh, like a super brown, but the easiest way to compare them, if you can see these decoys in front of me, have the red, white, and blue with the black body in one hand, and I have that grayish head with the brown body in my other hand. Right, next slide. Yeah, so going back to the head, you have the red, white, and blue. Uh, you have just a lot bigger body. The bright, bright red um, down here in the wattles. Uh, just shout it out. Does anybody know what this is called? It's the snood, yep. The snood. Yeah, uh, I can't I forget there's a slide in here. If not, we'll go back and talk about it. I do have, actually, we can just pass this around now. I do have a small, um, it's not freeze dry, it's just a fake turkey head that will show the colors. Um, has that nice big red snood. It's got the waddles. That's this flat down here. And then the caruncle is this piece down here and this back part up here. You have your minor crunkles and your major crunkles. Um, so what, later when we're talking about uh, turkey hunting, you'll, you'll might hear me say, shoot them in the red. Down there in the crunkles is where I'm talking about. Shoot them in the red, shoot them at the base of the neck. If you don't mind taking that and passing it around. Next slide. Yeah, uh, I feel like I keep walking out of the camera frame. Uh, so yeah, going back to the same picture, um, large uh, black body, a very mature beard. One of the things I most love about turkeys, um, I will sit and look at this photograph on Instagram for hours, is I love the iridescence. Uh, there's just such a beautiful bird. Um, my better half disagrees with me. She said, thinks you're the ugliest thing on the planet. I think a lot of folks agree with her. But to me, they're one of the most beautiful birds in existence. Next slide. 
So preseason scouting, so actually going out before hunting season, uh, what does that look like? And I love this picture of that bird flying up into the roost. Next slide. Yeah, so this is the part everybody seemed to love. Uh, yep, they're in my pocket. Um, I was kind of hoping to have this as a trivia part, not as already up there. I forgot to take the words out. But you can actually tell turkey genders by the sign they leave behind. That includes their poop. On the left, you see a hen, hen sign, hen poop. Um, it's going to be in a curly cue, looks kind of like an ice cream cone. I would not suggest licking it. Uh, why do hens do that? It's because when they're sitting on a nest, they do not want to have the scent of their defecate left behind for to potentially attract predators. So what does she do? She holds it. She waits until she's away from the nest, and then, allow, then she will defecate. And, but when it's backed up, when she's holding it, it makes it get that little mushroom look to it. Versus a gobbler or a tom or a jake or anything, a male of the species. Uh, long story short, he doesn't care where he poops. He's going to go whenever, wherever. So it just shoots through him like stools to the goose. And I just so happen to have props. Trust me, these are not real. They're not freeze-dried like everybody seems to think so. I'll pass those around. You can see life-size, what a uh, gobbler versus hen defecate looks like. Um, those are by far the most popular prop in this whole, this whole shebang. All right, next slide. Scratching. Uh, does anybody know what scratching is? It's, probably, it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Scratching is just when they're going along actually making, they're scratching the ground, trying to get at the food underneath the leaf litter, right underneath the duff. Um, one thing that I always thought was kind of cool is a lot of folks, it's pretty common sense, you guys will probably all know it already, but the easiest way to track birds when they're in the duff, because you can't always see their tracks, you can't always see which way their tracks are leading, but you can track them by the scratchings. Taking an average, not by the individual scratch, but by taking the average of all the scratchings in the area and going along. So when a turkey is scratching, uh, you ever, has anybody ever seen uh, chickens when they're scratching? He's facing, we'll say that turkey logo is up, is forward. The turkey's facing that way. He's going to have one leg going uh, out that way. And he always makes kind of a weird little inverted V. And by knowing that, knowing how his legs work, uh, you can follow that scratch and get a pretty good indication of uh, where that bird go, where that flock go as they were scratching along. Next slide. Tracks. Um, after a good rain, because the only time you're going to get tracks in Arizona is after a good rain, uh, you can track toms, you can track turkeys. Um, and it's pretty easy to tell the track from a tom from a hen. Uh, just raise your hand quick. Does anybody know how to do that? How do you, uh, how do you tell the difference? The male turkey's got his, I call him his fingernails. I don't know what they're actually called, though, but that's how I tell. <clears throat> Is there anything specifically about that nail? Well, he's got, so, yeah, that will show up a bit more, but what, uh, the way I was trying to go with it is that middle toe. On a tom, on a male of the species, that middle toe will always be longer than the two outside toes. On a hen, they're roughly, it's not always exact, but they will be roughly the same length. But on a male, that middle toe is always longer. You won't know if it's a Jake or a Tom until you actually get, your, your, get on to him, but that's a surefire way to tell at least what, uh, what you're following. Here, I'm going to pass that around. Next slide. Yeah, so when you're scouting, um, yeah, toe poles are great. Uh, obviously, this was made by somebody back east because um, everybody knows out here Onyx and Go Hunt and all these other apps. Um, I haven't seen my topo in a long time. Maybe it's my generation. I don't know. Uh, I'm going Onyx. I'm going to Go Hunt. I'm going to some other uh, app um, that's going to have my topo lines on it. Uh, obviously, USGS puts out some fantastic maps. Uh, maybe that's a generational thing. It's just my way of going about it. 
Yep, Google Earth, Windows. Uh, I got to admit, when I first saw this up here when I was putting this presentation together, what is Windows Live Local? That's something I had never heard of. Um, but yeah, maps can be a great help. Uh, so yeah, so let's actually get into the what we're actually going to do. Um, hearing and seeing turkeys, turkeys are going to roost at night in the trees. They're not, they're not a ground rooster, that means they're not going to be sleeping on the ground. They're going to fly up on a tree somewhere and sit on a limb. Uh, oftentimes, they're going to have a preferred roost. Unless they get bumped somewhere into some unfamiliar territory, they know their backyard. They know their bedroom. They're going to have not just uh, an area they like to roost in, not just a tree they like to roost in. They're going to have a limb they like to roost in. And if you can find that limb, you're a good way to kill that bird. Uh, when they're on the roost, a lot of times they'll talk. They're safe, um, apart from maybe from a great horned owl. But uh, they're going to talk. It's real easy to get them to strike. Um, later on, uh, yeah, well, so after they hit the ground, uh, it says look in the fields. Again, this was an eastern presentation. We don't have a lot of fields around here. If you do, you might not be in tricky country. But we do have natural clearance. You can look in those natural clearance, um, those parklands, and those birds will be working the edges of those. They'll be looking, uh, going on the roads. Uh, one of my favorite ways to, to find new birds in country I'm unfamiliar with is just start walking the roads, trying to find those sandy spots, trying to find spots for leaving tracks. I'm looking for scratch marks. I'm looking for uh, dusting areas. And by dusting areas, I mean it's where a bird has actually found loose uh, sand and has gotten down and tried to put some dust on his feathers. Um, help keep, helps keep the bugs off, helps keep the mites off. Next slide. So locating birds, um, yeah, when you're starting out, use a locator. Uh, if you're just trying to locate them, it's, I recommend personally not to use a turkey call. Sometimes that's the only way to get them to, to strike. To get them by, when I say strike or light, um, it means I'm getting them to talk and getting them to gobble at me. So when I'm trying to get a bird to strike, first thing in the morning, if I, especially if I don't know where he is, if I'm hunting a brand new area, I'm going in before first light, um, I just want to see if there's a bird in the area. Or I'm going in the next day, so I'm going around at, right at dark and trying to get him when he's still on that roost to know where I'm going to go the next morning. Uh, I'm going to hit him with a locator call. By locators, it's going to be just something loud. It's going to be just a bam, just to get him to turn around. What was that? And what I'm going to use for those is going to be a crow call if I'm back east. Um, sometimes I'll lay it off at Ravens here. But when I'm in the west, I always hunt with, uh, there's always an owl call and a coyote call in my vest every time. And I'm going to go to that owl call 90% of the time. A lot of folks like them. Yeah, um, he asked if anybody uses a peacock call. Um, a lot of folks do. Um, I've personally never used one. Uh, so Sounds like a coyote howling. Yeah, I keep it short and sweet. Um, so one thing I'm going to add to that is when I am trying to get one to strike using a locator call, I'm going to keep it real short. I'm just going to try to make a loud, sudden noise, get them to strike, get them to light at me. Uh, just because if I, if I call too long, if I make too many notes, sometimes my calling will drown out his response, and I won't hear him. So if I'm trying to do a real long, oh, oh, I don't need that, that tail end. He's, already, he's going to strike those first couple of notes. He doesn't need to hear the rest. But I'm not going to hear him if I draw it out. Same thing for an owl call. Usually I'll hit him nice, short, and sweet. Um, if he doesn't light at that, I might hit him with that classic eight-note barred owl. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Apparently that's a new one to Arizona. Uh, yeah, and then, like I said, I, don't, I prefer not to use a tricky call to get him to strike. If I'm in an area... Because when I'm doing this, I'm probably not near a place I'm going to set up to hunt. I'm just trying, I'm walking into a new area. Um, if it's dark, uh, well, it's dark, turkeys aren't going to be calling anyways. Um, but I'm probably not going to be next to an area where I'm going to want to set up. And I've had a lot of birds. I've made this mistake. The reason I don't do this is because I've screwed up. I've used turkey calls to get one to strike. I've had them not strike at me. And I've turned around and there's a bird 20 yards away strutting. Because they will come in silent, and they will be attracted to that sound. So if you're not ready to kill them, I would strongly urge not using that, that yelping sound immediately. 
Uh, using that locator, um, it's, you can use it both in the preseason and actually when you're hunting. Um, I use it all the time. Uh, if I'm learning, like I said, if I'm learning a new area, I'm going in and checking those roads. If it's an area that I can drive my truck on those roads, I'm going to drive every 150 yards to a quarter mile, depending on the country. I'm going to get out, let things settle down for five, ten minutes. I'm going to hit it with a locator call, see if I can get them to strike. If I don't, I go on the next one. Even if I do get one to strike, if it's before a season, on X, click, waypoint, and away I go. Try to find another one. I just keep doing that, trying to get as many waypoints. I want to have A, B, C, D. I want to have plans all the way to Z alpha. Um, because if you're turkey hunting, plans don't work. Plans, uh, yes, sir. Yep. Him gobbling. Him responding, him, him gobbling at me at, at, in response to that, to that sound. He asked what uh, strike meant. Next slide. Preparing for the hunt. Uh, actually, before I do that, um, has anybody here ever heard an owl call before, like in terms of a locator call? All right. There you go. All right, so uh, before I get to the, to the actual hunt, there's a lot to do. There's a lot you got to get done. Um, so let's talk about that. Uh, next slide. The turkey gun. So this is... Uh, Everybody likes to talk about guns. Everybody. doesn't matter what you do. Everybody wants to talk about the gun part. Um, turkey guns. Usually it's nothing shiny. You know, if you've got a high-gloss finished trap gun, it might not work in the turkey, gun, turkey woods. Uh, turkey hunters tend to prefer tighter chokes, something that you can reach out and touch them because we're not wing shooting. We're aiming at a single spot. And don't get me wrong, we are aiming. We are doing this like a rifle, but with a shotgun. Um, you're going to use some form of a sight. Whether that's a red dot sight, an actual scope, or just a bead on the end of your gun, you're going to have some, sight of app, some sort of apparatus to help you get that shot where it needs to go. Uh, pump or auto loader preferred. This is somebody else's opinion. Um, my opinion is run with your broom. Um, whatever you got, whatever you like is what you carry. Um, I recommend bringing a sling. Having some way to, to get that gun out of, out of your hands, get it on your shoulder, um, because a lot of tricky calls run off of both hands. Uh, when we're in a pot call, such as one of these guys, so I, have, I have need one hand for the pot, one for the striker. If I'm using a tube call, if I'm using my owl call, if I'm using the box call, i got to have both hands. So I like having that sling, get that gun on my shoulder. It's still ready to go at a moment's notice. Um, for the gauges, so I always say 10 to 20, or 10 to 20 gauge. A lot of folks, especially with TSS shells now, TSS tungsten super shot, uh, a lot of folks are going to 410. I have no issue with them. It's just I prefer uh, a 20 or 12. Um, I know a lot of guys still hunt 10. That's why I throw that in there. Um, and that's just part of me being a little bit hanging on to that old school mentality. But a lot of folks kill a lot. A lot of turkeys die every year now to a 410 with TSS. I'm not... I will never advocate TS, uh, 410 with lead. Uh, and then with those, those, those gauges, that uh, 20 and 12 gauge, your, your two most commons, um, three inch, three and a half inch. Uh, I cut my teeth on three and a half inch uh, leads out of a Mossberg 835. If anybody's familiar with that gun, it's a wonder I still have teeth in my head. Uh, next slide. Tricky chokes. Uh, yeah, most folks prefer uh, an extra full or an extra extra full. Something super tight. Um, if you're talking 12 gauge, anywhere between a, I've seen guys shoot as tight as a 640, but usually sometimes between a .650 and a .670. Um, nowadays with TSS, a lot of folks get it done with a full choke. I've actually heard with improved modified uh, shooting TSS, but most classic turkey guns are going to have a dedicated turkey choke. Um, it's going to be rated as that extra, extra, extra full constriction. Uh, patterning your gun. Um, so this is going right back to, there it goes. Uh, that, it's going to be, is it this coming Saturday or Saturday after Expo? April 1st. Yes, April 1st. Um, if you have not been out to pattern your gun yet before you go turkey hunting, I would highly recommend going to that event because it's kind of tough to find good places in turkey, uh, to pattern our turkey gun in the valley. Um, I know I've run into that a few times, but uh, is this one of the videos that worked? 
All right, so let's play this clip. Hi, Travis Sumner here with the National Wild Turkey Federation. You know, with any game we pursue, we owe it to them to make sure that we make a clean, ethical shot. Same thing with wild turkeys. When it comes to choosing the right gauge, the right shotgun, the right choke, and the right ammunition to make sure we can do that, sometimes it can get confusing. But let's look at the few basic things that'll make it easy for you. One, when you get ready to choose your shotgun, select which gauge. You can choose a 12 gauge, a 20 gauge, and even now, 410 gauge is out there and does a lethal shot on a wild turkey. When you select that shotgun, make sure that it fits you. Make sure that the stock, the forearm, and make sure it's gonna fit you and your grip. That's always important. Don't get something that's too heavy for you to hold, particularly if you're out there waiting a long time on that gobbler to show up. When selecting your shotgun, you may choose illuminated sights to help you better see and make a, a perfect shot. You may choose telescopic sights. Uh, you may choose a red dot sight. That's all user preference, so that's always up to you on whether you wanna be able to see clearly and make a good clean shot. A Little bit on chokes. And choosing a choke for a shotgun, and there's a variety of chokes out there, different constrictions is something that word you're gonna hear. When you choose a choke, first of all, you need to look, and a lot of things I would do is reference those chokes, look at different patterns. A lot of times you can see the shot placements that they've done. Think about how far you wanna shoot a turkey. You wanna shoot him at a long distance, or you wanna make sure you're right there at that optimal range of about 35 yards. When you choose a choke, select which one is gonna fit the ammunition that you're gonna to wanna to shoot. There's different ammunition out there on the market now, different shot sizes, uh, different ounces that are in those shots. You wanna make sure that your shell fits the choke that you choose. Then it's time to go to the range. Shoot that shotgun with that choke, or if you've selected different chokes, choose different chokes, different shot sizes, but take time on the range to pattern that and look at your shot placement on that wild turkey when you're out there on the range and make sure that your pattern fits inside the head. And what we're looking at is where the red meets the black, that's that lethal and your aim points right here. You wanna make sure that pattern is consistent on that turkey's head while you're out there. That way you'll be able to make a good, clean, ethical shot on that old wily turkey when you've been out there hunting them. Can we rewind that just a little bit? No? Okay. Uh, so did folks see that on the turkey target, I got one in my bag, um, which turkey targets, by the way, you can buy over from the store or if you go to uh, websites like mossyoak.com, they'll have free uh, turkey targets you can just download, print off, you're good to go. But did anybody see on a couple instances the shot pattern didn't quite hit where the turkey's head picture was. To me, that's uh, very, very common with turkey guns. You don't always shoot, they don't always shoot to point of aim. Um, point of impact does not always equal point of aim. And to me, that's a huge reason because we're shooting so, so tight to go either, does one, to, to pattern it, find out where it's hitting. And then if you wanna make the, that choice to, I would, I would encourage the uh, inclusion of a sight, whether it's the the sights, like the illuminated sights, like Travis was using the video, a red dot, a scope, whatever, but actually sighting in that gun um, and making sure that you, that that shop uh, pattern is gonna hit exactly where you wanted it to. And that's uh, just for showing my personal arm here, firearm is empty. Um, this is what I, I prefer to shoot, Mossberg 500, red dot sight, with a uh, 665 constriction uh, choke. And again, you know, it's got, it's got a sling on it. Because that's just how I prefer to hunt. Um, next slide, please. Camouflage. Camo is critical. And not just wearing a t-shirt, uh, camo t-shirt and blue jeans. Um, we're not hunting pigs. We're not hunting uh, mule deer. Uh, we're hunting something that's got really good eyesight. Something that can see you blink at 100 yards. Fantastic eyesight. Having some way to break up your outline is crucial to, to turkey hunting. Um, yeah, use a pattern that matches your surroundings. Uh, you know, I love King's Camo. I'm not going to wear it in Florida. Just not going to work. Um, so use something that matches your surroundings. 
Uh, you guys hunt around here, you know what looks good. Um, but including in your full camo, making sure you have something to cover your hands and cover your face. Because our, our hands when we're moving and our faces when we're, when we're moving, they shine like a beacon. Um, birds can pick that out, no problem whatsoever. Uh, I carry, I think there's four sets of uh, masks and gloves in my, in my go bag and two sets in my vest because I forget stuff like you wouldn't believe. So I always have extras. Um, that's how important masks and gloves are to me. I pack so many extras. Um, one is none, two is one, whatever that saying goes. That's, I go even beyond that for my uh, masks and gloves. Um, if you happen to forget mountain money, if anybody knows what mountain money is, it comes in a lot handy for that too. Um, mountain money is toilet paper, by the way. Uh, when it comes to colors, we talked about how a tom, uh, his, his head is red, white, and blue, and his body is black. So because that's what the turkey looks like, we never wear those colors. Um, because we never want to be mistaken in the brush for a turkey. Because some less scrupulous hunters uh, may see the color, may see the movement, and decide to take a poke. And you don't want your shoulder to be that poke. And it looks like we have a video clip here as well. Hey, I'm Travis Sumner with the National Wild Turkey Federation. You're going to see so his the face turkey a lot. hunter, the turkey vest is much like a fisherman's tackle box. You carry everything in there to put the odds in your favor. For a turkey hunter, his vest is his lifeline while he's out there in the field. Let's look at some things for the basic turkey hunter is a must to have in your turkey vest. You know, first and foremost is your calls. Whether it's your slate calls, your box calls, being versatile, having different calls to use out there for that wily turkey. He may be answering a box one day, but the next day you may need to go to a slate call. Using different strikers will help you sound like different turkeys on one slate call. Locator calls, a must. Whether it's your owl call, down to your crow call. Having something to locate a turkey first before you make your setup is always important. Sometimes it gets to the point where they might be listening to a lot of owls and a lot of crows. Then you switch to maybe a peacock or a woodpecker call or even a goose call would be a good locator call to have in your vest. Make sure you have your plenty of mask and vet, or gloves. The mask is always important. I've been known to leave my mask somewhere in the woods. Always having two in your vest is a good thing because you turn around on your neck setup and you're looking for a mask and it's not there, but at least you got a backup. Same thing goes for gloves. I like to carry two pair of gloves in my vest. Uh, this is probably the best thing out there is a thermosail. Having that thermosail, I can always put it beside me or strap it to my vest. Keep those bugs away. You don't want to be moving around swatting mosquitoes when that gobbler shows up. Optics, you know, having a good set of binoculars, of course, you know, they may be in my vest at times, but I'm wearing those. That way I've got a good way to, to pick up turkeys in the woods or in a field. Range finder. You know, for the beginner hunter, determining range is always a problem. So if you've got that range finder, you can get out there and range a tree, range a stump. You know exactly when that turkey's in range so you can make that killing shot. Of course, you always want to have your tags with you. Always carry them in a plastic bag in case they get wet. Ammunition. Always have your ammunition with you. And then as you move along, some other things that I carry, getting a little bit more advanced, I like to have a wing. I can mimic that turkey flying down out of the tree, scratching the leaves, um, or even a good old fashioned turkey fight out there. Something to carry that old gobbler out of the woods with. I've made a, a tote out of an old antler, and that's always easy to carry him out with. Carrying extra pegs for my vest, you know, uh, to hold up my decoys while I'm out there, because those seem to take missing on a, a given basis. You know, I always carry a few extras of those. Another call that I like to carry, getting a little bit more advanced, is a tube call. Uh, it's a change of pace where you're using your box calls, your slate calls, your mouth calls, but having that old tube call out there to locate with and even gobble on it is a great thing to have. Also having a good set of pruning shears. You never know when you may have to do a makeshift blind or cut some limbs down out of your way um, to be able to see. Or if you've got a new hunter, you want nothing to constrict their eyesight to see that gobbler. But good pruning shears are always a must. And, you know, you're out there calling turkeys, but you never know when the call may hit you. And always have this always ready to important. go uh, just in case. But 
as I said, a turkey hunter, the turkey vest is much like the tackle box. Always have your turkey vest ready and stocked up with the things you need so you'll have success in the spring woods. So, yeah, like Travis was saying, um, I carry a ton of stuff in my vest. Uh, I carry probably way more than I ever need. Um, what's on this table is not nearly everything that's in that vest. Um, I carry up to four different pot calls. I carry up to seven different strikers just because I'm overboard on everything. Uh, owl calls, I carry my locators. I carry an owl and a coyote at all times. I'll carry a crow call on occasion. Fox calls, um, mouth calls, I carry it around my neck all the time. Um, I got four, four different uh, calls of different cuts and reeds and whatnot in here. Um, I carry so much stuff, it's probably stupid. But uh, a lot of folks don't like wearing a, a vest, especially in Arizona. Um, we hunt bigger country, take a little bit more gear, more layers. Um, a lot of folks like to hunt out of a pack, and that's fine. That's a 100% personal choice. Um, my biggest thing I would recommend in addition to a pack is just having something to sit on, whether it's a small chair, uh, whether it's a, a different kind of seat, just something to sit on. Um, get your butt out of the wet, cold earth sometimes. That's always handy. Uh, before I go on into calling, does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. With hex camel? No, I've never used uh, hex brand camel. Any other questions? So I saw another hand go up. No? All right. So we'll get into turkey calling. This is probably the part that everybody actually wanted to be here for. I've probably been boring you most of the time. Um, yeah, so the, the, the most tricky hunters, the main attraction is the calling. It's the actually getting out there and having a conversation and talking to that bird, um, having that direct interaction. Uh, I know it's, it's what gets me up in the morning. I love hearing that bird talk. I love talking to him. Even if I never killed that bird, I always had a fun conversation. I always learned something. Um, and you never know. Some days you talk the talk, and some days he walks the walk. Uh, before you go hunting, learn before you go. Learn how to call. Don't make that first morning the time you, you start cracking open that Primos container. It ain't going to work. If you already know what you're doing, yeah, but not always. Um, there are tons of types of different turkey calls. Uh, they all work. They all kill turkeys. Um, by that, I mean they all attract turkeys so you can kill them. Uh, there's the old school. There's the quick question. Does anybody know what the oldest type of turkey call is? The oldest style of turkey call. Wingbone calls, yes. Uh, there have been versions of the wingbone call, which is a, a call actually made from a turkey's wing bone, uh, over 4,000 years old, uh, found in Native American archaeological sites on the East Coast. Um, everything from, like I said, I already mentioned the pot calls. Uh, I was called a pot call, slate call. Um, it's got tons of different names, but it's just a piece of material laid in a wooden uh, uh, this, in this case, it's a pot. Sometimes they come in a trough. There's different shapes um, of a slate call. There's the box calls. Uh, there's the mouth calls, the diaphragms. There's the tube call. This is, to me, the easiest kind of call to make. It's not always the easiest one to learn on, but this, for folks that might know, is a 35 millimeter film canister. Kind of rare nowadays. Actually, not really. They're like 50 cents on Amazon. But uh, all I did was take the bottom of it, Cut a half circle out of it, stretch some latex over it. Um, you can use just a latex glove, stretch it over, hold it in place for a band, get rid of the top, and you've got a tricky call for like 75 cents. I am no good on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, however it runs. I'm actually not sure if I need this, but there's different noises that you use to actually attract the tom. The easiest one is the one you just heard on that tube call. It's the cluck. And it's just a real short, just a tuck, 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 tuck. And it's just kind of a more contented sound. It's just a sound that children just kind of make whenever. Expanding from the cluck, you start getting into the yelp. That's the classic that everybody hears. That's that yelp, 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 yelp. That's that more 
Uh, it's more of a breeding sound that hens will make, um, but it's very, very common in springtime. And, it's, and the, the clucks and the yelps are the two most common that hunters, especially new hunters, because they're easiest to learn, will make um, to try and attract that tom. Uh, the third kind is the purr. And just kind of like, um, think of your cat. Just uh, I can't trill my voice. I'm not a good purr person. But it's just a, like a, yeah, I'm not a good purr. I, I can't, I've never been able to get that well in my throat. Um, so that's another tip uh, that hopefully everybody will kind of agree on for new callers is play to your strengths. If you know you're not a good cutter, if you know you're not a good, I'll talk about cutting. If you know you're not good at a call, don't use it. Don't use play to your strengths. If you know you're a, you got a great uh, cluck and a great yelp, that's all you got to do. It's all you need to do. Um, I've killed birds just clucking. That's, and so if he's hot enough, that's all he needs. Um, and the last one uh, that I've heard a lot of folks doing, and it's not on purpose, and it's the reason a lot of birds run away, is putting. Sounds a lot like a cluck. Um, but it's in, in the way I always describe it, and folks might agree, disagree, um, it's always based on context. A putt is an alarm sound. It's very excited. It's very, hey, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's, who are you? Who are you? And it's not a good thing. If you start hearing, if you got Tom coming in close, just a word of advice. If you got Tom in close and you start hearing, he picks his head right up and starts doing that little, it sounds like a cluck, but it's not. He starts doing that, kill him at the first chance because he's gone. He's heading the other way. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, so just a show, um, I can run through a different kind of couple of different calls. If I can figure out how this thing goes in here well. There we go. I got it. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the box call. This is for new hunters. Uh, this is the one I recommend you get. This is the style I, re I recommend you get. This one is actually a kit call. I paid like six bucks for it on a website. Put it together myself. Uh, I put it together. I mean, I, glue, I screwed the top on, put a finish on it, and that was it. Um, I think I was out the door for like eight bucks. Um, great way to learn. And you can put, you can, it'll make all the sounds you need. Um, I can't really purr on it. I know a lot of guys are great at cutting. Um, and by cutting, I've said it a couple times, cutting is an excited hen. It's, it's like the cluck, it's like the putt, it's a little bit more rapid fire. Um, let's see if I can do this without embarrassing myself on a mouth call. And if you have questions about mouth calls, um, you can come out and talk to me later because uh, there's that's a world unto itself on different cuts and reed thicknesses and reed counts, and um, that's a whole another world of calling. But you got, see if I can do this. So mouth calls are relatively new to me um, in use, and because I have the same problem that a lot of folks do when it learns comes to making these, I've always had a really bad gag reflex. I might do that tonight. You never know. Uh, I can make I can make I can make them sound pretty good. I can't purr, like I said. Um, well, let's give it a whirl. I can already feel it coming. Yeah, I can already feel that one coming. I ain't gonna go that far. Uh, But then we can go right back into the pot calls. And there's different materials you're going to see. You're going to have your classic, the slate call. A lot of the folks were bought. I bought a crystal one. Even though slate is the main material, um, you get them in different calling services. This one happens to be crystal. This one happens to be slate. And this one happens to be aluminum. I carry different uh, call surface and striker combinations. So all of these strikers have something different about them because they, in the different combinations, they all have a different sound. And one day, one sound might work. Next day, you might need a different sound. Uh, so you can. So that's going into that yelp. And that cutting is. Yeah, that one always slides around on me. And you'll find each call has its own little personality. Or maybe the striker is junk, I don't know.
So finishing into that strike, into that yelp. Um, and as you get into this, into this hobby, into this lifestyle, um, I have a hard time calling turkey hunting a, a, a hobby. Um, there's something about that first time you hear one gobble, it kind of consumes you the rest of your life, and you wind up working for the NWTF. Uh, next slide, please. Hunting strategy. We already talked about this a little bit. Um, but yeah, turkey, roost the night, turkeys the night before if you have the, the chance to. Um, not all, you're not always going to show up uh, at, the, at the proper time to go out and be able to roost. Sometimes you show up in the middle of the night and you're going to hunt the next day and you're in blind country. Um, if so, go to those apps, go to those topo maps, try to find some place to listen and be there before, well before daylight with that locator call and try to get one to light. You don't always have to have one roosted night before to kill one. I've had some of my best hunts on off the cuff, fly by the seat of my pants, and next thing I know there's one in my face in half an hour. Sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't, but you don't know from the seat of your truck. Uh, just to, uh, you can hold it here for a second, but um, when you do hear one, uh, this is gonna be a, a very it depends thing. But when you hear one, a lot of folks will ask, well, how close do I get? How close to that tom do I get? It depends. depends on the, it mostly depends on the country. It depends on if, one, you can get in there with, with plenty of dark, if, especially if you know the night, night, if you roosted him the night before, if I can stop tongue twisting. Uh, you can get in tight. You can get in. I've seen folks get in tight as 50 yards. Um, as a general rule, general rule, I like 100 yards. I've had some birds that I could not get in within 250 yards because of open country, because I was late, um, alarm didn't go off, dog threw up, for some reason I didn't get there in time. Um, but I was able to still turkey hunt, but I couldn't get it in as tight. So there's different factors. The answer is always it depends, but and that's always going to be an in the moment decision. Um, Pretty much my way of thinking is that get as tight as you feel comfortable and then walk away 10 yards or 20 yards. Give them a little padding. Just give them a little bit of doubt. When you are setting up, set up in the open. And by that, I don't mean right in the middle of the field. I mean where you're not going to have, don't be sitting way back in the brush where you're going to have stuff obstructing either your view or your ability to move and maneuver. Because turkeys have a weird habit of, no matter if you're right or left-handed, I'm right-handed, so left-hand shots are good. Birds have a wicked habit of coming in off my right. Doesn't matter how I set up, I've done it for years. He's got to come around from the right. And i got to be able to move somewhat silently, somewhat concealed, and to try to kill that bird. But if i got brush, if i got stuff on that side, I'm not going to be able to kill that bird. I'm going to watch him. He's going to start putting. He's going to walk away. I'm going to come back and hunt another day tomorrow. Um, another reason, turkeys don't like to walk into thick spots. If you're going in someplace unique, you're going after a hen, think about it, these birds live together. They know each other's voices. There's a stranger calling to them, attracting them in. Is he going to be, as, or are you going to be as more apt to walk into a dark, cluttered area or someplace bright and open? I'm probably not going to walk into that dark house after a voice I'm not familiar with. Uh, use a big tree. There was supposed to be a T there. Rock or stump for camo and protection. By protection, I mean I was talking about that same reason that you don't wear black, red, white, or blue when you're turkey hunting. Um, if somebody sees you move, they might take a shot at that movement. So you always pick your cover to be wider than your shoulders are. For some bigger folks, that could be a little bit tougher. But try to find something wider than your shoulders. It'll help conceal you better against the bird and conceal you from behind better from other less uh, scrupulous hunters. Um, and then going back to set up in the open, that's the same reason that I, uh, we, we preach about the camo. Um, wearing the face mask, wearing the camo that matches your surroundings. Let the camo do its job. Um, if folks elk hunt, you've probably heard that before in elk hunting. Um, you bought it for a reason, you paid all that money for camo, why go hide somewhere? Uh, let the camo do what you did, or do what you paid it for. And I believe this is the, the video that did not work, correct? I believe so. Uh, 
Yeah, we'll still that up. We haven't gotten too far away from calling. Travis Sumner with the National Wild Turkey Federation. For a lot of folks, it's when to call, when not to call, and how much to call to a gobbler. You know, that gobbler's going to let you know just how much he can handle or how much calling he's going to take. You know, the old saying is read the gobbler or take his temperature. Once you figure out just how much he can handle or how much calling you want to do, that will determine when you call, how loud I call, how much inflection I put in my calling. When do I get excited? When do I call soft? You know, that gobbler's going to let you know that. You know, the best rule of thumb, start out soft and slow. If he takes that, maybe bump it up just a little bit more. But remember, don't overcall. Overcalling to a gobbler will hang that gobbler up. Think about this, you're reversing nature. The hen calls to him, he gobbles, the hen goes to that gobbler. Here, you're making the gobbler come to you. So know when to call, when to stop calling, and make him get out there and hunt for you. That gobbler's gonna determine how much calling he's gonna take. Just remember that, read the gobbler, he'll let you know how much, how loud, and how little he's going to take. And that's why he's pro staff. But, uh, yeah, for folks who don't know Travis, he's pro staff for like Mossy Oak and Primos and all these other fancy outfits. Um, but like I mentioned for the pack, uh, get comfy. Have something to sit on. Have something to keep those thorns out of your tail. Um, be patient. Uh, that's, I actually want to start off with that, is to me the number one tool in my tackle box for killing a bird is not a call, it's nothing physical, it's just being patient. You know, patience will kill more birds than the best call on the planet. It's, yeah, I should have started off with that, but I forgot. Uh, be ready. Keep your gun up on your knee as much as possible. You will get tired. You will get sore. You will get uncomfortable. As best as you can, be ready. Because the time you put your gun on your lap to check your phone is the time that time's going to come in. Every single time. Uh, sit with your offhand side toward the gobbler. Like I mentioned before, I am right-handed. I already said this doesn't work all the time. I am right-handed, which means my left side is going to be faced towards where I expect that gobbler to be. Obviously, I'm wrong a lot, but uh, sit with that offhand. Same thing. If you're left-handed, put that right shoulder where you expect him to be. Watch, uh, expect for him to come out and follow that terrain, um, and where that shot you think is going to occur. Next slide. Calling strategy. Uh, again, don't be breaking open that uh, call container morning of. Learn how to call, but do it at home. Uh, learn how, it's very, very important to call well. Um, I really wish I had memorized, there's a Nash Buckingham quote that's saying the greatest tool in, in conservation is a duck call in the hand of the novice. Uh, because not calling is the best way to keep, make sure those, or not calling well and spooking birds off is the best way to make sure those birds survive. Uh, call sparingly. So this is going to go right back into what you just heard Travis talking about in taking his temperature. Um, don't go right in and start cutting at them. Just bah, 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 bah. don't just start hammering at them. Don't call super loud. Um, don't call while he's in the tree. Well, don't call a lot while he's in a tree. This is another part of contention among turkey hunters. Everybody's going to have their own flavor of the week as far as how they feel about this. Um, but call sparingly. Take his temperature. Find out if he's hot. If he's by what I mean by if he's hot, it means he really wants to play. He's talking a lot. It sounds like he's reacting well to your calls. He's not just calling to call. Sometimes Tom's will do that. You will think he's calling to you. He's just calling because he feels like calling. But take his temperature um, and figure out how he's reacting to your calls, what calls he's reacting to, or more importantly, what calls is he not reacting to. Um, if he's hitting my wing bone call, uh, why would I swap over to a mouth call? If he's not reacting to that, but he's answering the wing bone, I'll make it work. I'll keep calling him with that wing bone, and hopefully I got somebody else next to me that can shoot. Um, once, yeah, so once you know your bird's on the ground and off that roost, you can call a little bit more. 
Uh, and where I'm going with this is that there's some folks like a tree talk. Just super soft, subtle, just yep, 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 yep. Just super, every five, ten minutes, super, super quiet. Just trying to mimic a hen that's, all, that's still on the roost, let him know that, hey, you're over here. Start getting him thinking about coming your way when he comes off that roost and hits the ground. Um, once you know he's on the ground, once you've heard him hit, you start getting that. I'm not sure if that came through the mic or not. But you can actually hear those wings flapping as he comes to the ground. And you'll, some, you won't always hear his feet hit. Um, then you can call a little bit more. Uh, but again, you're still taking his temperature. Don't go overboard. Don't think because his, his feet are in the dirt means you can start cutting at him. Um, when he gets close, same thing. Shut up. That's the best advice I can have. If he's close, uh, make him start hunting you. Um, again, this is a personal thing. Everybody's going to have their own flavor. Um, I know goose calling, I like calling them to dirt. When I'm duck calling, I like shutting up before they come in. Um, everybody's got their own way of doing things. Uh, when he gets in close, by close, it's, again, it's going to be depends. Sometimes close is 100 yards, sometimes close is 30 yards in the, in the thick foliage of eastern country. Um, same way as taking his temperature, uh, he's going to have to play this one by ear. Next slide. What if he doesn't come in? Patience. Don't give up. Don't get up and move. At least, at least not right off the bat. Um, yeah, just kind of hang out a little bit longer. If you think it's time to move, give it another half hour. Try changing your calls. Like I said, he's not always going to hit that. You know, sometimes he's going to want that wing bone sound. Sometimes he's going to want uh, a certain mouth call. Sometimes I have to change up which pot call I'm using. Maybe he wants the aluminum, that higher pitch versus that deep guttural sound of that, that slate call. Um, you might be in the wrong spot. Uh, and what do I mean by that is sometimes, and this is where going back to look at those maps comes in, sometimes there's something in his way. Uh, there might be a crick. There might be a fence. There might be something stopping him. doesn't seem significant to you, but to a turkey, it's monumental. Um, there might be st something stopping him from coming into you. Um, especially in Arizona, you know, a fence line is a big issue. If, you, if you're on the wrong side of a fence, um, I've never actually had one fly over a fence. I don't know if you guys, any of the experienced guys ever had. Um, yeah, I've called them across cricks. I've called them up hills. I've done pretty much all the old wives' tales except call them across the fence. Maybe I'm just not that good a trick to call it. Um, but if you decide to move, you decide to, it's time to get up. It's time to go on someplace extra. Sometimes new. Be careful. Um, by be careful, I mean, I'm not just talking about look out for snakes. I'm talking about uh, looking around. Make sure he didn't sneak in on you. Birds will, it's a classic thing with turkeys is sometimes when they shut up, they're still coming, but they just don't, they already know that there's a hen there. You are the hen. So he doesn't need to gobble anymore. He's coming to you. And sometimes it'll come in quiet. And like I said, and I'm, I've had it before, like I said, off that right side where I've shut up, I'm waiting for him, he hasn't made a peep. I'm going to sit quiet for a few minutes, make sure he's not coming, make sure he's not going to gobble again. And all of a sudden, I've got a red head poking around the tree behind, beside me. He'd come all the way around, around me, and he knew, he knew exactly where I was, but he's never made a peep the whole way in. But in the way he came in, I didn't know he was there until he busted me. You will get busted. It's a matter of fact. It's a matter of life. It's as macabre as it is, it's one of the best parts about turkey hunting. You will get busted, which means you get to hunt another day. You get to have another conversation with them. You get to play the game again. Next slide. What if you didn't hear one? Uh, what if you're going into a spot, you, didn't get, you, you tried roosting the night before, you couldn't find a bird. You're going in blind. You can't get one to strike. You can't get them to, to gobble at you. Uh, this is what I was talking about before, moving that truck, um, going down those, those roads, walking a ridge line. Uh, it, your mode of transportation is going to depend on if you're on the, the Shoe Leather Express or your Toyota Tacoma. But what's going to be the same is you're going to keep moving. You're going to keep trying. Um, and this is, if, you're, if I'm moving like that, I'm going to go back to that locator call. I'm going to shut up with Yelpers. I'm going to shut up. Maybe I probably didn't even start a trick call to begin with. I'm going to, but I'll be changing it up. I'll be trying in the same spot. I'll run a crow call. I'll run an owl call. I'll run a coyote call. 
um, and all three in the same area, keep going until I get one to strike. I uh, might not get one to strike that day, but sooner or later, it's going to happen, and that's game on. Uh, yep. Yeah, closing the deal. Let them get close. Uh, turkey hunting is not a long-range game. Um, if you get onto the online forums, you might not think that. You'll see a lot of guys talk about using TSS, shooting turkeys at 100 yards. Uh, I'm a close-range guy. Again, this is going to be a lot of personals. Um, get them under 40. That is where your pattern is going to be open up very, very, very nicely. Uh, and you actually see, you're not having to deal with brush as much. Um, you know, but the closer the better. If he keeps on coming, why stop him? Uh, if, your gun, if his head is visible, if he can see you, and I swear turkeys have the eyes in the back of their heads, but they can see 270 degrees, by the way, around their head. Um, if he can see you, his head's visible, don't move. Not just don't move your gun, don't move. Uh, don't run to him as down. Oh, they jumped ahead of me on this. Yeah, so uh, when that moment actually happens and you get a shot opportunity, uh, you're going to be fired up. You are going to be as jacked as you will ever be. You will have the shakes, I hope. Um, I get buck fever. I get duck fever. But, man, there's something about a, a tom thundering in. Uh, the only thing I can compare it to is a bull elk screaming in your face. There's something about these guys that just gets me going. But, anyways, you're going to be jacked up. Um, so now is the time to start thinking. Thinking about where to aim, thinking about uh, this seminar and being ready for this moment. And you remember me talking about shoot them in the red. Well, thankfully on this, they blocked the red. So what I mean, if, if you don't mind holding up that head, please. Or I can grab it. Thank you. Is you have those caruncles, that big red spot right down there. That's where you are going to aim. Not up here. You're not trying to dome him. You're not trying to shoot his snoot off. You're going to aim right here. Your, your goal is to break that spine, and if your pattern is going to be around here, you might even get one into the brain. But aim there. That's going to be your best bet to make a safe, legal, ethical kill on a turkey. And then this is with a shotgun. We had some talks about archery equipment before. Um, this is all pertaining uh, to a shotgun. Um, but should that moment arise, you were able to squeeze that shot off. You saw him drop right there in the dirt. You've probably seen some YouTube videos where guys get up and they start making like Usain Bolt, uh, Usain Bolt and they're trying to get over to him and, and put a foot on his head. That's great. I would much prefer just kind of hang out for at least a second. You don't have to wait an eternity. But just be ready, just in case maybe you grazed his back. Maybe something went wrong. Maybe he went down just as a reaction, he's popping right back up. If you're to here with your gun in your hand and he pops back up to run, you're SOL. He ain't sticking around. He's going to get up. He's going to go. So just give it an extra little half second. Wait. Make sure he's down. Then go get your prize. Next slide. Once you pull that trigger, everybody knows this. Everybody in here hunts. Christian hunters of America. Once that shot wad is gone, it ain't coming back. You can't call it, you can't whistle it, you can't yell Dixie. It's gone. So make sure that when you take that shot, it's the right one. And always make sure it's a positive ID. Um, yeah, don't be shooting people's decoys. But uh, with that, that's the last slide. I think there's one more video on here. But before we jump into that, I'm going to open it up. Um, you guys have been great. Does anybody have any questions for me? I can talk about decoys. Oh, yep. I do. I, 
Yeah, so he's asking about, because um, I was told to repeat all the questions by, by David. Um, he was asking about, uh, well, the second part, I'll, I'll talk over the second part first, and then we'll talk about the first part. Um, which is better, cadence or quality of call? Uh, cadence. Being able, a bad caller, I told you to all be good, but you don't, you're not all going to be Matt Van Sice. You're not going to be Dave Owens. And these guys are competition callers. Um, you're not going to be fantastic. But you just got to kind of have an idea of what you're doing. Um, but having that proper cadence will get you way further than having the proper tone, the proper pitch, um, being perfect. Uh, if anybody's ever familiar with competition calling, duck calling, goose calling, turkey calling, whatever, a hen mallard will never make it past the first round <laughs> in, a, in a calling contest. Same thing for a hen turkey. It'll never make it past the first round. Because they squeak, they squawk, they make little bad noises, and yet the toms come in. So having that cadence, knowing what they sound like, and be able to replicate that as best as you can is better than being a perfect caller. And then for the box call, uh, I'm going to have you ask it again, just to make sure I had it clear. The box itself has a curvature normally on both sides. You've got to kind of figure out which side you want to use. There's a pickup method where you scratch and pick up the, the lid of the call, or you keep it on the surface and bring it back and forth. Chop, 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 chop. You want to take and loosen the screw up sometimes and get that lid top rounded point of that bottom part of the box because sometimes that's where you'll get the best sound. If it's off on the bottom this way or this way, it really should be closer to the top. I learned from a guy, and having a mentor is an incredible thing, but he cross-sanded the, the lid of, his, of the box call, just little grooves, very lightly. That way, when you use that blue chalk, because you have to have chalk for a box call, you make it so it actually bites better and it's so much easier to make yelps and chirps and clucks because you're constantly chalking your box call, trust me. And when you talk about learning to call, if you have a couple days that those birds don't gobble and you hunt from daylight to dark, how many times do you think you'll call during that day? You'll be getting more practice than you could ever imagine. And there's times, and I know you've had them, where we've gone two or three days, the whole camp, and never got a bird to gobble. And then all of a sudden, it's like fishing. Things turn on, and everybody's a turkey hunter. Yeah, exactly. I don't crosshatch. I know a lot of guys that do. Some of them even come that way now. Um, I've never been that way. I've always preferred. I just keep chalking. Um, I carry chalk. I carry it in my go bag, which stays in the truck. And I carry uh, multiple pieces in my vest. So what he's talking about, um, if folks have never been around a box call before, is this is the call we're referring to, the box call, is you have two pieces, two main pieces. You have your box, which has a beveled, curved, uh, calling, striking surface. Then you have what's known as your paddle. Um, they come in different lengths, different woods. But what's making the noise is that paddle going across that curved section, across that, that section. And the way, uh, if you don't have chalk on there, it'll just squeak, squawk, won't make any noise. But having chalk, having something to create friction on there is what actually makes that turkey, that classic yelp uh, sound on the box calls. Um, so yeah, like you were saying, some of them crosshatch. I don't personally. I carry chalk in here and in my vest, and I just keep chalking. Yeah, it's it's. Yep. Yep. All yeah. Always carry chalk with you. Yeah, we can. Yeah, or the bottom. It all depends on how you how you call. Um, but yeah, a, a quick uh, walk through what he's talking about is on this surface. Um, hopefully, you guys can see it. You can see it's not smooth. It's all scratched up, marked up, and that's from me taking sandpaper. In the case of a, pot, of a slate call, 
or like a Brillo pad in the case of something harder like glass or crystal, and I will take that and I will move it side to side in a straight line. I don't circle it, um, and glass and crystal, uh, because what you're doing is coming across those grains to make that. You're going across that grain, allowing that striker, this being the striker, the stick, to bounce across that call surface on your pot call. Uh, and then the same thing with other calls. Uh, if, you're, if you end up with a scratch box call, it's kind of an older school model uh, style of call, you again use chalk. The biggest tip I can give you about chalk is do not go buy sidewalk chalk. Again, do not use sidewalk chalk. It's got something in it. I don't know if it's an oil or a wax, but it'll grease up your call, and you're useless until you get off of there again. Um, if you go to your, your call manufacturers, uh, you'll actually be able to get the proper kind of chalk, um, whether that's you go to Bass Pro, get a little kit, comes in a, in a little mouth call case. Uh, I like Lynch. Um, like I said, I, I carry that proper just because I, I, I know it's right because I'm buying it from a call manufacturer. Buying that chalk, keep it, stick it everywhere. Because you're going to lose it, you're going to break it. Um, but yeah, always keep your calls chalk. Uh, same thing with mouth calls. If you go down the rabbit hole and you get in the mouth calls, take care of them. Because they're in your mouth, which means that they get nasty. Uh, so take care of them. By taking care of them, what I mean is my, proper, my way of doing things, this will be different, um, is the first thing I do is I take non-alcoholic mouthwash and I just chuck them in overnight. Um, the alcohol will, will mess up the latex and it gives it a better flavor. But dip it in there, just clean it up. Uh, and then when I take them out again, um, it goes right into a call pouch. The, this one in particular is ventilated. Uh, a lot of times they'll come in these plastic cases, but this keeps moisture trapped inside. So if you, if you can, have some way with a little bit of ventilation, um, let the, those calls dry out properly, fully dry out. And then if you're not going to be using them a while, like a few days, weeks, or if it's the end of the season, you're not going to be using them for months, take them, put them in, oh, like I said, overnight in that mouthwash, take them out, let them dry, pat them dry, whatever you, you want to do, and stick them in either the fridge or the freezer. The fridge, if you plan on practicing your calling more often, the freezer, if you're not going to be doing it for a long time. And that'll uh, help preserve that latex because some of these things are not cheap. Um, or you can be like me and just keep buying new calls every year. That gets expensive, but then you can try new things. Which is, that's kind of the spice of life, right? Um, yep. Quick kill with a bow. Yeah, uh, perfect. Perfect image for this. Um, so it's a little bit blurred, but hopefully everybody can see. So this bird is in strut. So you have your wing pocket is up here, and I'm short. But your wing pocket is up here, and then the, the leading edge of his wing is coming down forward like this. So what I, where I would go is you're going to see the, ro the pivot point where that, ring, that wing comes down. I'm going to follow that line down maybe about a, a palm's length, not the whole hand, but the palm's length. Come down, I'm going to get off that bone just a bit. I'm going to come forward maybe an inch. And that's where I'm going to stick them on this particular angle. Um, in the case if, say this was a tom, obviously it's not. Uh, if this bird had a beard um, and I had that frontal shot, it's still a good shot. I'm going to split the difference between that caruncle, that, where the red would be, and that beard. Split the difference and shoot it dead center. If that bird is in full strut and they're going to turn and rotate and spin and put on a little dance, if he pauses and he's looking straight away from you, so he's flashing you, he's mooning you, hopefully everybody here knows what a Texas heart shot is because that's what you're taking. Yeah, and then uh, this bird is having fun with a decoy, but uh, in the case of a quartering two shot or a quartering away, it's going to be a lot like harvesting. If, you're, if you have shot um, ungulates, big game, deer, with archer tackle, you probably know to come up that, that back leg. It's the same thing with a turkey. I'm going to line up that where the shot would have been broadside, 
and where I'm going to walk up that back leg, I'm going to split the difference on that intersection, and that's where I'm going to stick them with the archery tackle. Uh, is that good? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. So I had a distinct answer for this until spring hunt last year. So I always kind of rough to guessed it about an hour. I can still get one to strike. And then I went to a youth hunt last year. And a dad took his two kids out at 1030 at night and to strike birds in April and got a bird to strike. And we hunted them the next morning. That's the latest I've ever heard. I don't know if he had, I don't know what his lungs were like. They're a lot stronger than mine because I couldn't, I tried it in, uh, in Oklahoma six, mo- or six weeks later and couldn't get to work. But uh, I have seen it that late, but usually within an hour. I try to keep it as, as tight to sunset as possible. I'm going to let him, I'm going to have him call, and then I'm going to get out of there. I'm going to try to keep the stress off of him until next morning. I put, hopefully put a lot of stress on him. Yeah, you got to crank on. So just to make sure that the audio picked up, I'm just going to repeat what you said. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong because I'm probably going to butcher it. But uh, you said you've, seen, you've had them strike as late as 1 in the morning. Between one, yeah, in known roost, traditional roost. Yeah, we're going to take that root circuit. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> right. Which is, that's all a shot gobble is. You're just scaring them anyway. But, no, thank you. Any, yes, sir. That's going to depend on where you are at. Uh, some. Right. Yeah. So they're not going to be in 6A right now. They're probably going to be down in Unit 22, if they're on the southern end anyways. Um, those birds are going to be moving in there later. Uh, so this is kind of what we're talking about with um, how the seasons, how they'll, they'll change where they are and, and their behaviors by the season. So right now they're in their wintering habitat, um, and they're not going to be exactly where they are in, in April. Uh, in April, just to go in there, um, I don't have a solid answer for how big a Tom's home range is for a Miriam's in Arizona. Yep. Fifteen miles, and that was with just make sure that the audio that was with a ghoul's turkey that came in, and that was ba- it was. Yeah, it had a transmitter on it from an LSU study. Yeah, Louisiana State. Yeah, no, uh, uh, Mark Chamberlain's doing some wicked work over there. Yeah. And if anybody's on social media, I would highly recommend getting on. There's, uh, if you go on Instagram, he's, he's, uh, he goes by Wild Turkey Doc, and he always posts up wild, uh, Turkey Tuesdays. Um, if you ever want insights into the, some of the background, the little small things about turkeys, uh, definitely jump on there. He's on Facebook, too. Um, uh, definitely jump on there because you learn some really cool things about wild turkey biology um, from him, Dr. Lashley. Uh, there's so much you can learn from social media. As much of a bane as social media is for the hunting culture, hunting community, it's also such a fantastic learning uh, learning tool. Any, you want me to, to show you a deke or you want me to? All right. Uh, so he's asking about just wanting to talk about decoys. Um I will be 100% honest and say I don't always use one. It is, 
it, it's, it's just like everything else tricky hunting. It depends. Uh, for me, using decoys, that usually means that I'm uh, mentoring. I'm guiding a hunt. Um, and by guiding, I'm not a professional guide. I'm mentoring. Uh, it just seems guiding just rolls off the tongue a little bit better. Um, if I'm guiding a hunt and I need a bird to focus somewhere other than the kid or the new hunter, if I need to look somewhere else, um, because usually new hunter is a little bit more fidgety than a more seasoned hunter, I'll put decoys out. I'll, I'll use the decoys to take them off of something. Um, if I'm in more open terrain like Arizona, sometimes I'll throw them out. Um, but I'm generally what's known as a run and gun hunter. Um, I don't use decoys. I try to use the terrain uh, and set up the terrain to, to get a better shot. By that, what I mean is I look for when I'm calling, and if I'm trying to pick a spot to call from and, and hopefully kill a gobbler, I'm going to be looking for a break in the hill that I can get 20, 30 yards behind that break on the other side of the hill from where that tom is coming from. So that tom can never see me calling. He can never know exactly where that bird is, that, that hen is until he tops that, that ridge and starts coming down and realizes, uh-oh, there's not a hen here. There's something else going on. By then, he's in shotgun range. Um, if I am running decoys, uh, there's a lot better decoy people than I. Um, a lot of folks will have, will have uh, very, they're very opinionated on which way the decoys should face. Um, some folks like it to face directly at them. Some folks like them directly away. Uh, I don't have an opinion on that because, like I said, I don't use them enough. Um, I, will, I will say I will generally run, uh, if I'm going to run two decoys, it's going to be a jake and a hen. If I run a single decoy, for whatever reason, I've had better luck with just a single jake. Just something that Tom can come in and kick his tail. Uh, because I'm mimic mimicking the hen. The Jake, I'm, I'm assuming this is how the biology works, is he thinks the Jake is coming in to poach his hen. He's going to come in and kick some tail. Um, and I've had really, really good luck when I use decoys using a single Jake decoy. Um, I apologize for not having a more in-depth answer for you. Anything else I can hopefully answer? Oh, when I'm, yeah, when I'm sanding a pot call, uh, what do I use? Uh, either 180 or 220. Yeah, yeah, on a slate call, I'll use a sandpaper. Yeah. All right, while they're having their conversation, any more questions? Yes. Do we have any taxidermists in the audience? <laughs> would you mind coming up here and answering that? And would you mind, uh, what was the question? Uh, how, does the taxidermist how does a taxidermist want you to prepare your turkey after harvest? All right, the first thing, do not gut it. Everybody feels you need to gut a turkey to save the meat. You don't have to. What I always tell my people is, in my vest, I carry a Ziploc bag with a paper towel and it has uh, one zip tie. Once you're done shooting your bird, you take your pictures, it's cooling off, put that Ziploc bag over the head, zip tie it around there because you're gonna shoot a bird in the head with a shotgun. What's that shotgun gonna do? It's gonna bleed it out. When you get to your cooler, what do you tend to do? Tuck that head in, put all those nice feathers around there, and then you just get a clot of blood that is one to get out that it takes hours to clean it. So other than that, you have probably, if you Put it in your ice chest. What I always tell people is I always do the frozen two liters. When it's in there, it's on the bottom of my ice chest. My bird's on top. It's in a trash bag is what I use for my body bags. And I pull that drain plug. So if any water comes out, it's not going to get on the feathers. It's going to drain out, and your bird's going to stay cool. You have about four days in an ice chest. After that, get it in the freezer and just freeze it. When I, when I get birds in, I'll defrost it out. It usually takes three to five days in my fridge. And... When I skin it out, I can save all the meat anybody ever wants. Half the time, people say they want the meat, and they never come to pick it up, though. So just food for thought. Kyle, on that picture up there, what do you think is the bird picture that? On that one? I would, yeah, that beard I see. That one I can't really. Yeah, also, if you see the one on the left, it's yeah. like a yeah. Kyle's good, but yeah. 
So another thing, too, is never shoot a bird in the strut. Everybody always does. I know a lot of people, like, when they shoot them, they like to run up on them. I'm a guy who, I, when I shoot a bird, I run up on it. The reason being is when it flops, all those tree branches, all that dirt, it's pulling feathers out. And if it's something I'm going to mount, I want it to be as perfect as it can be. And when you have a chunk of feathers moving because it flopped and people bring me bags of feathers, you can only do so much with them. But it is what it is. Like archery birds, if you shoot a bird with archery equipment and you want to mount it, pack paper towels in those holes where that arrow went through because that will just keep the blood in the body. Yes? Yeah. Yep. Any other questions on the taxidermy aspect? All righty. What are those green tickets, by the way? What are those all about? All right, Jeff, let's have a big hand for Jeff for the presentation. Appreciate it. And again, just so you know, Jeff's with the National Wild Turkey Federation. He'll be glad to talk to you about that organization. They do some fantastic things. Um, one of the things that is coming up for, I saw a lot of hands go up for guys that said they had tags, right? So who's got a tag in 4A, 4B, or 23? Handful of you. Okay, I know you two guys do, but that's okay. Um, and then I see a lot of kids here. There is a youth camp. There's several youth camps going on, but the one that I usually go to is up at Colcord, which if you draw a 23 tag, but the over-the-counter is in 4A and 4B for the youths under 18, um, it's a great opportunity for you not only if you're an experienced hunter or just want to help to show up and mentor kids, okay, because there's going to be a bunch of kids that show up there that have never turkey hunted, mom and dad that come up with them may not have ever turkey hunted, and I guarantee you, if you've been out once or twice, you know way more than they do and they'd love to have somebody go out with them, or if you just want to hang out, and if you've got the hunt after that youth hunt, because it's the weekend before the general season opens, it's a great time for you to get out there and scout for your hunt, too, and give back a little bit, okay? So there's also one up in 6A. Yeah, that, that, yeah, 6A. Yeah. yeah, so there's also a hunt in 6A up in Happy Jack. Um, 6A for youth is a drawn tag, but there's also over-the-counter in 5A and 5B right across the road. Um, and there's a third hunt put on by Youth Outdoors Unlimited uh, in Units 1 and 27. Uh, I know they camp in 27. And those are both over-the-counter tags if you want to make the drive up to the White Mountains. So any of those camps are great to get the kids out. Um, they're all family-friendly, so we get a lot of, you know, wives, full families, the whole thing there. They've got a lot of activities during the day. So even if you don't go to the camp and you're up in that area with your kids on the youth hunts, stop in. Just say hi. They have activities on Friday and Saturday. Uh, usually camp tears down about noon on Sunday, but it's a great opportunity for just to stop in and learn some stuff. Or if you can't find birds, stop in at that camp and just ask. Everybody there will be glad to point you. Um, so, um, all right, so we've got a drawing. Kyle was great enough with um, Cut and Strut Taxidermy to donate a full turkey mount, if I'm not speaking incorrectly. Okay. Yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure for about fifty, sixty thousand, he'll sell you each of those birds, right? Something like that. So yeah, just go see him. No, um, he does a great job. Whether you want to just have a tail fan mount or a full body mount, whatever your you know pleasure is. If you have more questions about what to do with your bird after you shot it, I know he covered it quite well. Um, it is. It's one of those things. First thing you want to do is cut out all the meat, right, and leave a pile of feathers and. If you show up at his door like that, it's going to be a very expensive job for him to fix that all up for you. Yeah, we have reels up in the north, but not... Yeah. Yeah. All right, so... So we're going to draw now. You want to draw? Yeah, come on up and draw a picture. Uh, I need the number. 
six one four three six five. <laughs> three six five. All right. Here we go. All right. So Chase. Yeah. If you ever kill a bird again, you can get one mounted. <laughs> That'd be a good one to do too. So, all right, well, um, if any questions you have, we'll all stick around. Um, you will be here. There's more. Um, do we have the shotgun that we're giving away? Where's the raffles for that? Right here as well? Woo-hoo. All right. So, all right, get your, get your shotgun tickets out. So, do we have them? Oh, yeah, there are two different colors because we did sell this gun a little bit online ahead of time as well as today. All right, so she's better make sure Dad didn't buy a ticket though first, right? Online, okay. So sorry, it's not somebody here unless you bought it also online and bought more here tonight. Um, we do have a few people that did that. What's the number? One hundred seven. One hundred seven. Five eight one zero seven is a Dustin Law. Is Dustin Law here? Nope. We'll call Dustin, make sure he knows how to get a hold of his shotgun. So, again, thanks, everybody, for coming. Appreciate it. Um, oh, real quickly, um, our annual elk seminar. You guys probably, if you've been around for a while, you know we do an annual elk seminar. That's normally in July. We've changed it up a little bit just to make it easier, we think, for everybody. It's going to be on May 13th here on May 13th. It's a Saturday. So look for announcements on all the specifics, but it's going to be a, a midday event, family, bounce house, shooting, archery range, food, the whole deal. So it's going to be, you know, family friendly, not just a couple hours after work one night that you're scrambling to get there on time. Um, so we're going to have multiple speakers we're planning on that day, besides an elk seminar. Um, we're going to have multiple speakers, so we'll be putting out a schedule on, on different topics that we'll also have besides specifically elk hunting that day. So keep an eye out on all our social media. We'll announce it. Sir. May 13th is during turkey season, correct. So get a bird early, and then you can, you'll be open on Saturday. 